Uh, hi, my name's Kevin Backhouse. Um, I'm a security researcher at SAML. Um, this talk proposal was actually originally written by my colleague Sam Lanning. Um, unfortunately, he double, book, double booked himself, so um, he asked me if I could come give the talk instead. Um, just to explain a bit about my background, I've been a, just a regular developer for most of my career, and I've only been involved in security for maybe the last year and a half. I've kind of fallen into it by accident. Um, and so, in fact, my knowledge of security, there's probably an awful lot of stuff about security that um, you people in the audience know a lot more about it than I do. Um, so I'm going to stick to the thing that I do know something about, which is about finding and fixing bugs in software. And that's the focus of this talk. Um, OK, so variant analysis. Who's it for? Um, so this is specifically about if you're writing your own software. Um, so it's about finding bugs, but it's not about um, things like um, checking that the libraries that you depend on are up to date, that you're not running out of date software, that kind of thing. This is specifically about if you've written your own software and also very much that that software is exposed to, um, like has a, a security kind of attack surface or maybe it's safety critical. So this is also relevant to people who are doing software for things like, say, a car braking system or something like that. Um, and the third item is that what I'm really going to focus on is instance response. So suppose that um, a vulnerability is found in your software. You need to fix it. Um, it. And there's time pressure to fix it. And you, make sure, you need to make sure that it's thoroughly fixed so that it doesn't, there aren't other instances of the same bug. That specifically is what this is about. And it's kind of... The, 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 the kind of time pressure aspect of it is, is quite important. Um, you, you often don't have a lot of time to, uh, to fix vulnerabilities when they're discovered. Um, so I'm going to start out with some examples, just so you kind of know really what I'm talking about here. Um, so this is something I saw on Twitter just about a week ago. Uh, this is um, Project Zero. That's Google's uh, security research team. Um, they put out this tweet, um, and I followed the link to see uh, what this was about. Um, so let me just highlight a section of this. So this is a bug report filed by Tavis Ormandy, who's a, a security researcher at, um, at Google. Um, and you see this comment here. He said that he, there was already a bug, bug number 1690. And he was testing the fix for it, and he found another bug. Um, and uh, before I go on, I'm gonna, in a second, I'm going to click that link, 1690. But before I go on, I would just also want to highlight um, this here about the 90-day disclosure deadline. So um, Google are pretty strict about this. If you are on the receiving end of a bug report from Project Zero, then you have exactly 90 days to fix that bug. And they've got an automated system, this, this monorail system that they have is automated. It will publish the details of that bug, whether you fixed it or not, after 90 days. And this is a common feature. I mean, other security researchers do the same thing. They might not have access to an um, automated system like this, but there's usually a, a, a deadline um, involved. And so that's a topic that we're going to return to later. So if we follow this link to bug 1690, Um, then we see almost the same thing. He was looking at the fix for a bug 1682, and he found that it wasn't fixed properly, and he found yet another way to, um, to, to trigger a problem. And if you follow the link to 1682, again, I mean, it's just a never-ending tale of misery. Um, and in fact, these, these bugs go back a lot further than this. I mean, he's been finding bugs in GhostScript for years now. Um, I'm going to stop there and move on to a different bug. But you kind of get the, the, the picture. I mean, there was this one bug, and you'd think that they'd fix the bug, and then they'd be done with it. But, but it's not, that's not what happened. It's like this never-ending sequence of exactly, almost exactly the same bug happening again and again. Um, so um, this is another um, similar example. Um, 
Apache Struts um, OGNL injection. So um, what OGNL is, is a scripting language that's used in Apache Struts. Um, and it's intended to be used for kind of internal scripting processes. It's not intended that you should be able to connect to Struts over the internet and run your own OGNL. Uh, but that's exactly what's happened um, in all of these cases. And you can see that these bugs go back to 2012, which is probably, uh, I'm not sure the exact history of this, but at some stage, Struts became Struts 2, and I think that's when they introduced OGNL. And I think ever since that point, these vulnerabilities have been happening. Um, and so the most recent of these was just a few months ago, um, and that was found by Mo, who actually sits next to me at work. Um, so I'm actually, just, just to kind of show how serious this is, I'm just gonna show you quickly a demo. Um, so uh, this is where I'm gonna run struts. Uh, right now it's not running yet, so I'm just gonna pull up a terminal. Um, so I just need to start it here like this. Uh, so if I go back to the web page now and run it. So this is the Struts um, showcase application. So it's this is this is their kind of demo that shows you what you can do with with Struts. Uh, and you can go and play Hangman if you like. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is go back to that terminal. And there's two payloads that I need to send it. Um, so you can see I'm just curling something here to that address that Struts is running on. Um, that first one doesn't appear to do anything, but what it's actually doing is switching off all the mitigations that they have in place. And it's removing the whitelist. And so then the second one is the one that does the... Uh, the thing that has a visible effect. And look, there's my calculator. Oh, it disappeared. There you go, there's my calculator. Uh, and you can actually see here in the payload, uh, where is it? Xcalc, there you go. So <laughs> there's a whole load of um, OGNL around this, and the OGNL has to be URL encoded, which is why there's all the percents in there. Uh, but what you can essentially do here is you can paste in pretty much any command you like, um, and so obviously it's traditional to pop a calculator, but what you could also do would be something like installing your own SSH key on the server so that you could then log in, that kind of thing. Um, I am just going to uh, stop that now, because I am on the conference Wi-Fi. I don't want anybody connecting to my computer. Oh, actually, one last thing I just did just want to show you. Struts is still working totally fine. So it's like nothing happened. So after somebody's run this exploit, there's probably no way to detect, unless they start leaving files lying around on the server, there's probably no way to detect that anything even happened here. OK, now I'm going to shut it down. What is that? 740, it looks like. Yeah, it's gone. All right, good. OK. Um, so the next one, I'm going, going to go into a bit more detail on this one, because uh, this is one I found myself. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to show you the code um, to really explain um, what happened with this bug and how, in really quite a small amount of code, there were multiple problems that didn't all get fixed in one go. Um, I'm going to uh, run the video from over here, just so that it doesn't depend on the internet. Um, there we go. Um, so that's me uh, typing some commands into this computer that I have right here. And it's going to send a malicious TCP packet across to the Mac. Um, and the Mac just crashed, because that was a bug in the kernel of, the, of Mac OS. Um, so, let me close that now. Present again. So, there were actually two bugs that I found, all in this um, source file called packetmangler.c. 
um, which is in the XNU kernel of Mac OS. Um, the first bug that I found was an infinite loop. So when I sent the packet, rather than the computer crashing like you just saw, what instead happened was that there was an infinite loop in the, uh, the networking code, which basically knocked that computer off the internet. Um, in fact, the first time that I triggered it, I thought it hadn't worked, but then I was trying to kind of look at web pages on the Mac, and it, it took me way longer than it should have to figure out that um, <laughs> I'd actually done something to the computer and it wasn't connected to the internet anymore. Um, so I'm going to show you the infinite loop bug first, and then slightly later I'm going to show you the, the stack buffer overflow, which is the one that caused the, the kernel to crash there in that video. So this is the code in question. Um, and this is in the packet mangler, which is something that processes all incoming TCP packets to the computer um, and mangles them, I guess. Um, so what it's actually looking at here is the header of the TCP packet. Um, and obviously, that can be attacker controlled. I mean, anybody can send a TCP packet to the Mac and put their own data in the header. So this value here is attacker controlled. Um, and it can, in fact, be negative, if you like. Um, so then what's next? Um, so that means that, um, I mean, so this buffer is, in fact, only 40 characters long. And so you can easily write off the end of that buffer if you feel like it. Um, but then there's more. Um, you're then going to be updating TCP optlen, which is the thing that controls whether or not the loop stops or not. Um, and so when I first wrote the exploit to trigger this, what I thought was going to happen was that I was going to get a, I was going to um, put garbage onto the stack or a lot of ones onto the stack and it was going to crash. But in fact, what happened was that the TCP optlen became negative and because um, this value here, the loop only stops when that value is exactly zero. If it's negative, it just keeps running. Um, and so it turned out that rather than crashing the kernel, it just got stuck in an infinite loop. So let's see what they did to fix this. Um, I'm just going to toggle back and forth, because it's pretty subtle what they did. Uh, so you can see there, they made a few small changes. So the first one is they changed that to an unsigned number. So it can't be negative anymore. That's a good change. Uh, they also put in a bounds check there, so we can't write off the end of that buffer anymore. That's good. Um, and they um, don't allow negative values anymore, so that's a good change. Um, so the story here is that I first reported this bug to them in the summer of 2017, something like July 2017. And they said they were going to fix it. Um, and then I didn't hear anything from them for about half a year. So I contacted them um, January of this year to say, uh, what happened with this? Did you, did you fix it? And they said, oh, we're really sorry. We, actually, we did. It's already fixed. Uh, and they retroactively credited, it, credited me for it in um, Mac OS 10.13.2, which I think was October, something like that, um, 2017. Um, so I'm looking at the code. And I actually don't remember which exact version of the code I was looking at because Mac are very, Mac, Apple are very slow to release. It's, this is supposedly open source code, but they're actually really slow to release the, the latest version of the code. Um, so I don't know if I was looking at the up-to-date version at the time. Um, but they're so similar, these two versions of the code, that I didn't even realize that anything was changed. Um, and so I'm looking at this code, and um, I'm looking here at this. That's attacker controlled too. So what about if it's zero? Then um, what happens is that TCP optlen just doesn't change. So again, you've got an infinite loop. It just keeps going. Um, and I think when I originally reported this bug to them, it was this was like right at the beginning of when I first did started doing security research. Um, I just assumed that if I told them about one bug in this code, that they would then go through it with a fine tooth comb and make sure that absolutely all the bugs are removed. But that turns out not what happened. So there's another bug right here. Um, so I updated my um, um, 
my exploit and sent it to them, and it was still working in the beginning of this year. Um, but then, I, so at that point, I realized that they really don't actually bother to check this stuff thoroughly. So I started having a little bit look, more of a look around. And so, um, oh yeah, that's the, um, that's the fix that they then eventually put in for it. So they, they put in uh, that bounds check. So I can't trigger that infinite loop anymore in that particular part of the code. Um, but so yeah, there was this other bug that I found, and that was in this other section of the code. And you can see this is the exact same loop that we were looking at before. So this is just 10 lines up from the, the other code that we were looking at. Um, and so again, we're looking at attacker-controlled data. So that is stuff that I can control with the TCP packet that I send to the Mac. Um, so if that value is zero, and then you subtract some number from it, then you're going to get a negative number. Um, and so what that means is that this thing is going to be negative, but that gets turned into unsigned, which means that it becomes a huge 64-bit number. Um, and so what then you're able to do is um, copy an unlimited amount of attacker-controlled data onto the stack. Um, and so that's what uh, you saw in the video, was that I sent a TCP packet with um, that th off value set to zero, and then I think about 4K of zeros after that, and so it just completely trashed the stack and caused the, the kernel to crash. Okay. Um, and these are, the, uh, these are the mitigations that they've now put in for that. So, so that one is, is thoroughly fixed now. They've, they've got an, a bounds check there like they should. So in summary, um, there were multiple bugs, and they were all within 55 lines of code. Um, and it took them multiple attempts to fix those bugs. Um, and um, what I think happened here was that I sent them an exploit POC, and all they did was they made sure that that exploit POC didn't work anymore. And they didn't bother to um, really thoroughly check the rest of the code to make sure that everything was fixed. And it seems to be that that's the same thing that we're seeing in all these other cases as well. So like the, the ghost script case um, and the, the OGNL case. Okay, so why is it that there's never just one bug? There's always many many bugs in the code. Um, and these are a few, few of the reasons that I can think of. One is that this might just be a badly tested area of the code base. Um, you, it, it might be that it was written without kind of good development practices. It doesn't have a lot of unit tests, that kind of thing. That might be why there's a lot of bugs. Um, sometimes you have a flawed design that just makes the code bug prone. So the OGNL stuff is probably an example of that. The fact that you have an interpreter inside your application that can basically do anything, including calling out to the system, that's maybe a design flaw. Um, uh, another um, kind of good example of something where you've got a, a, a kind of a core design flaw is Java deserialization. So this is a decision that was made a long time ago in, in, in Java. And it just, it's just led to years and years of misery with these, these Java deserialization problems just popping up over and over again. And that's due to a, really a, just a, a bad design. Um, sometimes you have a confusing API that can lead to errors. Um, so I'll actually show an, an one example of that later. Another one that you might have heard of is the, uh, the zip slip vulnerability. And that's where you have these libraries for unzipping um, zip files that you can use inside your application. And Developers using that library often don't realize that you might have a relative path inside the zip archive, which could then give you a path traversal vulnerability. And so it's, that's just kind of a, like, the, the, the library's working exactly as it's intended. They probably didn't intend you for to, to download a zip file off the internet and then unpack it. Um, if you're just un using it to unzip your own stuff, it's fine. Um, so it's not that there's a bug in the library, it's that there's an API that you need to be careful with when you use it. Um, number four happens often. Uh, this sounds like kind of bad development practice, so you shouldn't do co copy-paste, but in fact, I would say that's not always true. Um, a, a lot of the time when you're uh, coding, you, if you're trying to figure out how to do something new, what you do is you go look to find other examples of how that's been done elsewhere, and sometimes that's elsewhere in the same code base. Other times it's 
you go on Stack Overflow to see how is it that you write this code. And so as a result of that, bugs can get proliferated across code bases and even across into completely different, different code bases. Um, and then the fifth, uh, sometimes you, you just have developers who um, aren't very careful. And so they might have made similar mistakes elsewhere in the code base. Um, and I think one factor that's actually involved here as well is that sometimes um, it's hard to measure the quality of code that people produce. It's much easier to, to measure the quantity of code that people produce. And so sometimes you get these people who are really kind of seen as rock star developers who, and the reason for that is they're ge generating a lot of code. They're doing a lot of features, but they might not be being so careful along the way as they're, as they're writing that code. So they may have been spreading um, similar kinds of bugs all over the application. Um, okay, uh, something else. This is like purely anecdotal. Um, I don't have any statistical evidence for this, but um, something I do think you should bear in mind is that vulnerabilities are pretty rare. Um, I mean, when I'm doing uh, research looking for bugs in code, I ignore almost everything that I see because I don't care unless I can actually write an exploit for it. Um, and so I think if you're on the other end of this, if you're receiving a bug report or you discover that there was a breach, then you have to assume that that one bug that was used there was cherry-picked out of all kinds of other stuff that the, the person who developed that, that exploit may have, may have seen, but they just picked the one thing that they could really use to actually exploit your application. So if there's a vulnerability in your code, I reckon there's probably at least 100 other bugs in the code that may not be vulnerable, vulnerabilities that can be triggered by an exploit, but they're still bugs. Um, okay, so another thing I want to highlight here is that there's kind of two ways in which bugs can get proliferated through the code. One is that sometimes you get clusters of bugs. So that was the, what we just saw with the packet mangler example. You get bugs that are all in the same place. Um, but what you also sometimes see is that you get um, bugs that actually get scattered across the code base. Um, so arguably, the, the, the first two cases are kind of easier to handle because if you know that you saw a bug in a particular part of your code base, then you can just go scrutinize that particular part of the code um, and make sure that everything's fixed. But the, the other ones are a bit more difficult to uh, track down because they could have been scattered all over the place. Um, and so that's uh, an area that I'm going to focus on with when I talk about variant analysis. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about the incident response process. So um, this is a bug is found. So uh, security researcher sent you a bug or um, a breach happened or um, there was like, you, if you're working kind of more in the safety area, you're um, working on car braking systems or something like that. Um, uh, maybe an accident happened, something like that. So you find out about a bug. Um, what do you then do? Well, obviously, the first step is you need to diagnose what went wrong. Um, but then what's really important is this third step, which is discovering variants. Because, because of what I've just shown you, it's pretty likely that if there was one bug, there's actually going to be many bugs. And so this third step is really important to go and look for other, other variants of that bug to make sure that you fix them all. Um, and like I said before, there's often time pressure involved here. So maybe you've got a 90-day deadline that's been given to you by Google. You've got to get it done within a limited space of time. And then the fourth, sp fourth point, uh, there's less time pressure on that. But you do want to make sure that you don't have the same bug in the future. Uh, you want to prevent your developers from making these mistakes in, in, in the future. OK, so what kind of techniques are there for discovering variants of bugs? Um, step zero is... I think completely obvious. You obviously have to write a regression test for the bug that was found. Uh, so I've got that one zero because that's not really a variant. That one's the original bug. Um, so then step one, you should definitely do a, a really thorough code review of the place where the bug was found. Um, if one mistake was made in that code, then there's a good chance there's going to be other mistakes in that same area of the code. Uh, you should obviously write 
unit tests for that area of the code. Um, and I would recommend that you check code coverage results for the unit tests. You want to make sure that you've got unit tests that really cover um, almost 100% of all the, all the code that's, that's um, involved here. Um, fuzz testing is a good idea if you can do it. Um, fuzz testing in general can be, uh, I think, kind of a, quite a lot of work to get that up and running. But in this case, you presumably already have a known input that triggers that particular bug. So what you should be doing is trying to generate random variations of that particular input. So for example, with that TCP thing that I found in macOS, you should be generating other randomized versions of that same TCP packet to see if there's other problems that you might be able to hit. Um, maybe worth looking for other code that was written by the same developer just to see if maybe they made similar mistakes elsewhere. Um, and then the five, fifth one is the one that I'm going to focus on now because it's perhaps the least obvious how you would do it. Um, you should search the code for similar, similar patterns. Um, so what do I mean by similar patterns? Um, so in the case of the um, packet mangler bug that I was talking about earlier, I, I guess the, the, the patterns that you would look for are things like that, that looping pattern where you're only checking for zero as the termination condition of the loop. That would be a pattern. And so if you see a greater than zero rather than an equal zero, then that's a, a more reliable test. Um, the other thing to look for would be parts of the code where they're using the TCP header data type. Um, this is a different example. Um, this is a, a bug that I found in um, librelp, which is a component of the rsyslog logging software, which is um, used on most Linux systems. Um, uh, this is an example of a confusing API. Um, so we all know that sprintf is dangerous. We should be using snprintf rather than sprintf. Uh, but it turns out that um, this particular code pattern can actually also trigger a buffer overflow, even though they're using snprintf. So the idea of snprintf is that, um, hang on, I'm not going to do that yet. Um, you pass in a size argument. And the size argument tells snprintf how big the buffer is. And snprintf will not wrote right over the end of the buffer. So you can't have a buffer overflow. Um, but what they're doing here is they're writing multiple strings into a buffer in a loop. And so what they're doing is they're calculating how much space is left in the, in the buffer to make sure they don't go off the end. So this all looks good. The reason that there's a problem is because the, the API of SMPrintf is not what you might expect. If you try to print a string with SMPrintf that's bigger than the buffer that you're trying to print it into, then the return value of SMPrintf is actually the size of the string that you try to write, not the size of the string that you actually wrote. So if, for example, in this loop, you've almost filled up the buffer, you've got 10 bytes left in the buffer, and now you're trying to print a string of length 100, then it will only print 10 bytes into the buffer because it's only got 10 bytes left, but it will still return 100. So on the next iteration, this variable i all names is actually bigger than this, the size of this buffer. And so just like we saw before, you get a negative integer overflow. You end up with a huge value being passed into snprintf. And at that point, you can write as many bytes as you feel like into the buffer. Um, and what actually makes this worse is the fact that you get a gap. So because I wrote, I tried to write 100 bytes, I only write 10, but it updated the pointer by 100, it ends up skipping over 90 bytes. So what that means is you can bypass the stack protection mitigation. So they, they, um, the compiler puts something called a stack canary on the stack, and if you overwrite that, then it will immediately abort the program. But with this, you can skip over that and place the data wh exactly where you want it. So this is actually a pretty dangerous vulnerability. So what we want to do is we want to search for this pattern. Um, but we don't want to just search for all um, calls to SMPrintf. Uh, most calls to SMPrintf really are safe. Um, so what are the features of this pattern that we want to look for? Um, first of all, it does need to be a call to SMPrintf. Um, but you also want it to be a call to SMPrintf that has a percent %s in it, because 
unless you've got a percent %s in it, it's unlikely that an attacker is going to be able to control what gets written and the size of what gets written. And so it's less likely to be interesting to them. And then the final thing is that you want the output of smprintf to be fed back into the input, the size input of smprintf. And if you've got all those elements, then that makes the pattern that you want to look for. So how do we do this? Um, so the idea that we have is uh, what we refer to as code as data. You want to take your source code and import it into a database, and then you can write queries to look for those kinds of patterns. Um, so when I said that, it probably sounds a bit kind of pie in the sky. Uh, this is actually real. Um, <laughs> And we can do it, but I don't want this to turn into a vendor pitch, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But um, we, we can write an, a very accurate pattern for this that finds exactly this and, and nothing else. OK, so um, this is my final slide. Um, this is a, a kind of a more detailed version of that um, diagram with the four boxes that I showed before. So, And this is something that you can read on. Um, so Michael Fanning is a, um, he works at Microsoft. He's um, somebody, uh, he's a static analysis expert. Um, and he's written this blog post, which I recommend you go, go have a look at, uh, at later. Um, and this diagram is in his blog post. And so Microsoft's obviously one of the most experienced organizations in the world at um, instant response. They have a whole team called MSRC, which deals with um, security vulnerabilities that are found in Microsoft products. Um, and so this is part of the process that they follow. So assuming that, they, that a security bug is found, obviously the first thing, like before, is you um, diagnose what went wrong and you fix the bug. But then what they do is they use this code as data idea. They write a, uh, they codify what the, um, what the pattern was that caused the problem, and they run that query to discover variants. Any variants that they find, they fix. Uh, but what tends to happen is when you're first starting to try to search for these things, you tend to get a lot of false positives the first time you run it. And so it's a kind of iterative process where you write a query, then you make it more accurate, and then you go back and you, you update the query so that your query really gets the real bugs and ignores the stuff that's not interesting. Um, and then once you have that, um, so up till this point, this all needs to happen um, quickly. But then one, after that's happened, um, you can then, at your leisure, uh, take care of this part, which is you should now start monitoring continuously for this, um, this problem so it doesn't happen again. So for example, with the SN printf example that I just showed you, that should then become something that that test gets run as part of your pull request integration so that if a developer ever writes code like that again, it will get immediately flagged and that code won't actually ever make it onto your master branch. Um, and so that, that bug is eliminated forever. Okay, um, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you can read more about this on our website, lgtm.com. We have uh, a blog there um, where we talk about the um, security vulnerabilities that we found. So those, um, the OGNL thing that I just mentioned and the, um, the Mac OS and the SM printf thing, they're, they're all blog posts on that website. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, perfect. Uh, so we've got our next talk in a minute from Petco.